Hello, I'm Gregory Battle in the Embedded Operating Systems class with Professor Pons, and uh, today I'm going to be giving you a short presentation on getting a very basic general purpose input and output pin to work, and then saving that data to a file. Uh, this is a topic that Professor Pons has covered in class, but uh, it is among the more useful topics, at least to me as an electrical engineer, that the BeagleBone can do to interact with the outside world. So why do we need data? Data is key to understanding feedback given from any system that will help you understand the dynamics of the system better. For example, let's say we had a car with a body that's supposed to perform better aerodynamically than other cars in its class. While it might look like the car is indeed performing better than its rivals, the difference cannot just be attributed to the aerodynamics package alone. It could come from anything, like a better engine or a better driver. So how do we know the aero package is better? Well, we would have to isolate that part of the system we would like to focus on, in this case, like the spoiler or the front nose, put that part through the air, and then measure data. So once we have a place to test our data acquisition system, we need to mount the sensors to it. These sensors are transducers, meaning they convert physical forces into electric signals. These signals can then be turned into quantified numbers that humans can understand. But uh, how would we know where to place this and what to measure? This brings us to the design portion and knowing how to measure things intelligently. Mounting a sensor, a button, and defining what these sensors or buttons read is the first part of the data logging process. Once you have your sensors mounted, the next thing is to feed the output of that sensor into a data acquisition device. These devices can be extremely specific, only working with one type of signal and often being proprietary. However, these devices can also be extremely general such as the National Instruments MIDAC, which effectively replaces electronic labs with how many things it can properly measure. But more importantly, microcomputers, such as our BeagleBone Black, are starting to come with onboard systems that facilitate the entire process of capturing data. There exist many protocols by which sensors can operate, such as I2C. However, for the purposes of this tutorial, I will be using a push button that creates a digital high or low. As such, the signal is extremely easy to read. So we'll begin by making a circuit that will enable us to interpret the button's inputs. The first thing we need to figure out is what GPIO pin we would like to use. In our case, we can use the BeagleBones Black System Reference Manual to find a suitable pin. In this case, an excellent candidate is pin 12 on the P9 header. In order to figure out what this pin is internally to the BeagleBone, we'll have to look at its name in the manual, which is GPIO1 underscore 28. The BeagleBone has four banks of 32 GPIOs, which means that the 28th pin on the second bank is what we're looking for. Uh, note that the first bank is named 0 and not 1. So a bank of 32 pins and then add 28 more pins into the second one will give you the internal GPI number that we need to use inside of the BeagleBone's Linux. This is GPIO 60. Knowing that the BeagleBone can only source and sync current in a range of about 4 milliamps, we should be wise about our choice of resistors. In this case, we have a source of 3.3 volts, so a 10k in ohm resistor will suffice to bring the circuit into a pull-down configuration, where the BeagleBone can only source and sync 330 microamps a circuit. What this means is that it uses an external resistor to help distinguish digital logical values by pulling down what could be a floating value to zero. In our case, we have a circuit that takes its voltage value at the positive side of the resistor. The BeagleBone's digital GPI opens can only take 3.3 volts, which is why we are not using the 5 volt supply. Once you have your circuit properly set up, you'll need to first verify that the BeagleBone is in fact reading your values properly. We can do this by using a secure shell. So we'll start off by logging into the BeagleBone and obtaining root access so that we can manipulate the GPI opens. First, we should change our directory to slash sys slash clash slash gpio. Once in this directory, using the ls command will reveal our gpio controllers in a file named export. At this point, our pins are not available directly to software, so we would need to export the pins to the software to interact with them. By using the command echo 60 greater than export, we can reveal gpio 60, which is pin 12 on our p9 header. Doing this, now we can change into the directory of the GPIO60 and interact with various attributes of it. In our case, there are two files we should look at. The first is direction, using the cat command, 
and we can discover if this pin is currently an input or an output. By default, this pin is an input, so we don't need to change it. Now we can use the cat command on the value file to see what the current value of the pin is. Using cat multiple times and pressing the buttons reveals that I am changing the value by pressing the button, so we know this works. You can now unexport the pin and return it to how it was, or if you want to get a holistic idea of all the GPUs on your BeagleBones, you can change directory to slash sys slash kernel slash debug and use the cat command on a file named GPIO to get a whole printout of your exported GPIOs at the time. Using this command and looking at the contents of the file again and pressing the button on my circuit, I can see that the value here is changing from low to high and a high to low. Now we're going to be talking about setting up a C++ program to look at that value file we saw before and save that data into a file every time it accesses it. To do this, we're going to be using Eclipse, set up with an ARM cross-compiler and set to be remotely deployed using tools provided by Eclipse. The first thing we should look at is the code. Now we can continue and start looking at the code itself. Most of these includes are very standard. The only one that's uh, of note is the unistd.h, which is a Unix standard type of file. And of course, I'm using namespace std. So let's move on to the main function. The first thing we want to do is initiate file streams to handle some files. Here I have two file streams, file and file value. I need two separate file streams to write uh, two different uh, to open two different files and then read a value and write a value. And then my next part of the program is exporting a GPIO pin, which is just a direct file path to the file and then echoing 60 into the, the pin like we did in the shell. Uh, we close the file and then we open the log file and this is the data logs.txt. Uh, it needs to stay open during the for loop. This is where I print out the starting log and I also print out start log for the file. And here the for loop we have uh, integer x is equal to 0 and then it goes to 10 and what this means is that it'll take the sample 10 times. The duration of the logging is dependent on how long you make the x. So in this case 10. Uh, the file open, this one opens the actual value found in the GPIO 60 file and then we use a get line to read that value and then I have a backslash here test for when I was debugging it and then we close the file so it can update. So once we have that value read we write that into a variable called my value and then we write that into the file handled by file value and it'll write it into the data logs file. And then I'll use a sleep function to slow the program to pull. In this case, sleep is in seconds, so it sleeps for one second, and then it writes a log, and then it starts the for loop again. Here, I have the terminal where it says end log, and I also have in the file, it'll write end log. And then it'll close the file after the for loop to update it. And when we're finished, it's good practice to unexport the pin. So we'll just use the file handler to open up the export, echo in 60, and close it once more. Once we verify that our code builds, we should next take a look at the remote deployment system. When I set this up, the deployment system could do everything except log into my BeagleBone as the root user. I don't know why it refuses to do it, but in order to run the program, I first have to run the configuration toolbox to deploy the project to BeagleBone. Then I have to manually log into BeagleBone using Eclipse's secure shell. I have to use the chmod744 command to make an executable file and then I have to manually type in dot slash and then the program's name, which in this case is GPIO underscore export. I named it this because I ran a program called GPIO on my own system to verify that it would compile correctly, as this was a work in progress. And when it did, I copy and pasted it into another project that was set up specifically for cross-compiling. This way I did not have to go back and forth between projects. Once the code runs, I have to set it up to only notify you when the program has started logging and when it has stopped so that it does not clutter up your terminal session. Now that we can look into the datalog.txt file to see what the program was actually reading. I've taken two separate logs and I was playing with the buttons to generate them. Just to verify everything works, I'm going to log out of Eclipse and access my BeagleBone directly from Linux's terminal. 
Here we can see that I've run the program again. I've also collected more logs. A little bit of background on why I chose this topic. The first data acquisition device that I ever had experience with was an engine control unit called the Megasquirt. More specifically, the Megasquirt 2 version 3. The Megasquirt is an open development embedded system, meaning that they provide the source code and allow you to read internal data of the system in the log files. This is important because many vehicle manufacturers hide their data behind proprietary walls and read-only memory, meaning that accessing any data on a stock ECU in a car is nearly impossible. The best part about the Megasquirt is that it included its own generated pulses in the data log files as well, so you could see what it was receiving as input and also what it was making as outputs. This is a demonstration of the level of data logging I can hope to ever achieve with the BeagleBone, as it effectively provides as much information as it can with a small amount of sensors hooked up to it. At the time I was using it, I could not appreciate the amount of effort that goes into making a system this big that can read so many inputs and write so many outputs. As I've gotten to learn in this class, embedded systems take a lot of work and it took several days of effort to even get this small tutorial to work with a single digital pin in a simple program. Thank you for your time. This concludes my short tutorial on reading a value at the GPI Open and then saving it to a log file for further use.